Good morning and welcome to Worship from Tabernacle Panar. We are so glad that you can join us this morning and I really pray that you can take part in every aspect of this service as we meet together. That you'll be able to sing, that you'll listen and engage with the word, but that you'll be able to pray. But let me pray for you now before we start. Heavenly Father, would you come and inhabit our praises this morning? Lord, would you change us from the inside out as we meet together to worship you? And Lord, may you be blessed by our praises. Amen. Good morning, church. It's Jack here. I just have a few notices to share for the start of our service. So first of all, we are really excited to be joining in with Thy Kingdom Come this year with a 24-7 prayer event. This is where we as a community are going to be taking it in turns to pray continuously for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we would love for you all to get involved. There's so much in the world now that really needs to be covered in prayer, and this is a great opportunity to really dedicate some time with God. So to find out more about this and to sign up for when you are going to pledge to pray, just go to tabs.church slash thy-kingdom-come. That's got a lot of information there and also it links to the prayer schedule where you can book out your hour slots for when you are going to pledge to pray. So yeah, get involved guys, we would love to hear from you. Also, for Thy Kingdom Come, you might remember previously we sang the Worship Central song Pray quite a lot last year. Um, this is a, uh, a song that's basically just the lyrics of the Lord's Prayer set to music. We would love for you to sing along with that song and film yourself doing that and send it in to us. Um, some of our amazing editors then will splice it all together um, it, and hopefully it'll be a, a great video that we have at the end of it. So to find out more about this project and to get involved, just go to tabs.church slash sing dash together. Um, all the links should be available in the description for the video. Finally, we wanna hear what's going on in your life as well. Um, if you have a testimony to share, if you uh, wanna tell us about how God is working in your life at the moment, then get in touch. You can contact us at contact at tabspenarth.org.uk. So that's it for notices for today. Next, we're going to pass on to Simon for worship. Good morning. As we come to worship this morning, let's have a look at the words from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and how fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles from Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines a number of stars and calls them by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. Let's come together and join in singing some songs in worship to the Lord our God this morning. Show your power 
the hope for our nation You are the Lord It's the power of God for our salvation You are the Lord We ask not for riches but look to the cross You are the Lord And for our inheritance give us the lost Lord, show your power, O Lord our God. Show your power, O Lord our God, our God. He is the Lord. And He reigns on high, He is Lord. Spoke into the darkness, created the light, He is Lord. Who is like unto Him, never ending in days, He is Lord. And He comes in power when we call on His name, He Lord, send your power, oh Lord our God, send your power, oh Lord our God, show your power, oh Lord our God, show your power. Bye. 
I'm Dot, one of the deacons at Tabs. This morning's reading is taken from chapter 1 of the Book of Acts of the Apostles, starting at verse 1. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father's promise, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set 
by his authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I don't know about you, but at the moment I seem to spend lots of my life waiting for things. I wait in queues to get into shops. I wait for Amazon to deliver something I've been waiting for for ages. I wait for the daily briefing at five o'clock. I wait for my husband to ring and we cram a whole day's conversation into a few minutes. I wait for him to get home safely on the weekend. I wait for the time when I can have a really nice cup of coffee or when I can go out with friends for a glass of wine and a catch up. I wait for virtual services online. I wait for Zoom calls. I wait to hold my grandson again. I wait for life to go back to normal. Over the next couple of weeks, we're asking the question, why are we waiting? And we're looking at the first two chapters of the book of Acts and asking ourselves, why are we waiting? At the moment, life is all about waiting and it's really not easy. Petty irritations become magnified in the confinement of our lives. Now, why, for instance, does my son turn the dishwasher off when it's running, take out the large glass that he really likes, close the dishwasher and not turn it back on again? So that when I go to open it, it's full of dirty dishes and cold, scummy water. I also don't understand where that bar of chocolate that I bought and squirreled away disappeared to. I obsess about things and run through conversations and online correspondence in my mind, going over and over it, trying to second guess the emotions and the feelings that I can't pick up because I'm not talking to that person face to face. In the passage that Sally read to us, we get a glimpse into another time of waiting. It's the time between Jesus' ascension, that just means his return to heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The book of Acts is Luke's second volume. It finishes the story of Jesus' time on earth and begins the story of the church and through the witness of the church, the ever-growing establishment of the kingdom of God. The writer, Luke, begins with a short recap for Theophilus. Though if he was anything like me, Theophilus would probably be skipping through, wanting to get to the action, not wanting to go over what he's already read. But Luke is scrupulous in his detail, so he carefully sets out the introduction to this book for his readers so they understand that the good news of Jesus is totally inclusive. It's for everyone. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the men. It's not just for the educated. It's for everyone. He tells us, for instance, where the action took place. It took place in Jerusalem in a room. He tells us when, 
40 days, 40 days after the Passover, 10 days before the Feast of Pentecost. He tells us who's involved, Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, Judas, Mary, Jesus's brothers, in all it says about 120 people, all in one room. He tells us what was happening, but that for 40 days Jesus had been with them, going over and over things, making sure they understood what it meant to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. It was like a final cramming session before an exam. But verse 6 tells us that they still don't get it. They are still waiting for Jesus to mount a white charger, charge into Jerusalem and restore Israel, kicking out the Romans. They don't realise after years of training that it's now their job to establish the kingdom. John Calvin wrote hundreds of years ago, marvellous is their rudeness, that when, as they had been diligently instructed for three years, they betray their ignorance. I think Jesus must have been slapping his head in desperation. Would they never get it? And why are they there? Why are they waiting in Jerusalem? Well, they're there because Jesus told them to. In fact, it says he ordered them. That's like commanding them. That's like the commander of an army saying, stay there, don't move. Wait in Jerusalem. They're not to go off a wandering. They're not to get distracted. They're not to try and go it alone. They're not to do anything until they are baptised by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who will empower them and equip them for the job ahead. Perhaps Jesus reminded them of his words that are recorded in John's Gospel when he told them, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not, the helper will not come. They had to wait. And so they do. And perhaps it's difficult. Perhaps they get impatient with one another. Perhaps habits begin to grate, but waiting is biblical and we can find hundreds of examples throughout the Bible to wait, exhortations to wait. Being able to wait, being able to be still stems from being confident and focused in a loving God who keeps his promises even when everything around you is in chaos. As we wait, we're strengthened and prepared for action because action always follows waiting. And when we're released into whatever God is calling us to, we need to get it right. We were reminded last week that spiritual maturity, that ability to live in the world, reflecting and witnessing to the love of God, comes not from age or experience or education, but from practising the presence of God. In other words, from prayerfully waiting, seeking the Lord. So Luke tells us that Jesus' friends wait. They wait together and of one mind. It says they're united. They're not criticising or complaining. They devote themselves to prayer, waiting for the Holy Spirit because the task before them, the task that they're called to is immense. When they leave that room, when they step out onto the streets of Jerusalem, they will bring about the kingdom of God. They will establish the Christian church. They will be witnesses to Jesus, not only in Jerusalem, it says, but to the very ends of the earth. They will speak to powers and authorities they will be opposed, ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned, face horrific deaths. And so they wait for the promised helper. At the moment, we are slowly being released from our waiting. Pundits and commentators tell us that nothing will ever be the same. 
the whole world has changed. Financial insecurity hovers over households and countries. Jobs have been lost or are under threat. Relationships are strained through too little or perhaps even too much contact. Little gaps that were there before have become great gaping chasms. The danger from the coronavirus may be reduced, but it hasn't gone away. We long for the way things were before we went into lockdown. We long for a return to normal when we'll be able to go to work, to school, to restaurants, to hop on a bus or a plane to visit friends or family, to celebrate and to worship together again in person. But when we re-enter the world, when we leave our upper rooms, it will be different and this time of waiting will be followed by a time of action. Are we prepared for it? We may have made physical preparations, we might have our face mask and our hand gel ready. We may rigorously observe the two metre social distancing rule, but are we filled and empowered to go? To go and live a changed life in a changed world? Are we ready to testify to the love and provision of our God? Are we ready to say to folk who don't know Jesus, yes, I know life is difficult. It sucks sometimes. I know that things are tough. But do you know that you are loved unconditionally by God? That he has a plan for your life, a plan that is good, that he will never leave you or forsake you? Are we ready to face the challenges of meeting together for worship in a new way? Statisticians tell us that churches will likely lose a third of their congregations during this time. That over the months in isolation, we will have broken the habit of going to church. How much harder is it going to be to go back when we can't talk to our friends, when we can't mix over coffee after the service? when we can't sit next to each other? How much harder will it be to give our money? The world will be different. The church will be different. And we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to empower us to live out our faith in this new way or we will surely fail. As we look towards Pentecost, as we continue to wait for release, can I urge you as followers of Jesus to be of one accord, to set aside time to be devoted to prayer, to pray on your own, pray as couples, pray as families, as small groups, as friends. Invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Ask for filling and refilling. Be open to his presence and be empowered to face the task that God is surely calling you to and be witnesses in your homes, your streets, your towns and to the very ends of this earth and may his kingdom come. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have this opportunity to wait that amidst all the chaos of normal life, we can be still. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, now, as we sit in our homes, we open our hearts and we invite you to come in, to fill us. Lord, would you speak to us? Would you show us where you want us to go when our doors are opened? Who you want us to talk to? how we can be the best witnesses to you. Lord, we thank you that you have promised that never will you leave us nor forsake us. And Holy Spirit, we claim that promise now. We claim it for ourselves as we are now in our homes and we claim it for ourselves as we move out in the coming weeks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, 
for your love and your care for us. Amen. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let us bring our prayers with thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, we are facing such a crisis at the moment. So many people are unwell and thousands are dying. So many have lost family members. People have lost jobs and businesses as the economy of the world crumbles. People are scared about their futures. Lord, you are our rock and our fortress. In you we place our trust. Please turn your face towards us and save us. We cry out to you, O Lord. We give you thanks, Lord, that even at our darkest times, we know that you have promised never to leave or forsake us. You tell us, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God. In you, we can put our trust. We thank you, O Lord. We pray for our political leaders here in Wales, the UK and the wider world. Lord, give them wisdom and guide their thoughts and their actions as they seek to combat the current crisis and the many other issues our countries face. And Lord, help us to respect our leaders who you have put in authority over us. We cry out to you, O Lord. We thank you that you give wisdom and knowledge to our scientists as they research how to fight this virus. We thank you that trials on vaccines are starting and look forward to the day when a cure will be available. We thank you, O Lord. We pray for all those essential workers who are keeping things going and providing vital public services. We pray for doctors, nurses and all in the NHS, for carers, for the police and fire officers, for dustmen and those who keep our justice system going, for teachers and staff in essential shops. We cry to you for their protection and ask that you will strengthen them and give them all they need to fulfil this vital role. We cry out to you, O Lord. And we thank you for the selflessness of all those essential workers who are putting us before their own safety. We thank you too for those who are demonstrating love to the lonely and the vulnerable, or to strangers or neighbours who formerly they would have just passed in the street. We thank you that this pandemic is bringing our fractured society closer together and that we can see how much we need each other and you. We thank you, O Lord. We bring to you all those who are suffering in our church community or known to us. We pray for those who are housebound and isolating, for those in nursing or care homes, for those who are afraid or anxious. Lord, let them know your presence with them and give them peace. And for those who are unwell, we pray for healing. Let us take a moment to think of our brothers and sisters in need and perhaps name some. We cry out to you, O Lord. We thank you that we are part of your body. We thank you that even in these strange times, new ways are being found to be a loving community that takes the good news out into the community. Thank you for the way that the food bank is a real expression of your love and is meeting the need of the hungry in our area. Thank you too that these online services are reaching so many people bringing joy and hope. We thank you, O oh Lord. We bring our prayers and petitions with thanksgiving in the name of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus. And we ask that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard all our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. strength
within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that cast out fear are working in our waiting sanctifying us when beyond the understanding you're teaching us to trust the plans are still to prosper you've not Gotten us, you're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. You are wisdom. Who could understand your ways? Reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly. And then you uphold me And your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper You've not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood Some final words from Psalm 27. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon the rock. And I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And I pray that you have a safe and a blessed week. 
and we look forward to joining you in worship again next week.